T family, but uh, he is with us uh, today, and he's still upstairs uh, reviewing some things with some folks. Uh, also, Mr. Larry Wilson joined us. Uh, many of you know Larry Wilson. He is uh, uh, someone else who's been with DLA for many years, and he is heading up the infrastructure area at headquarters. And he's the guy who works with all of the field activities on the IOP and uh, makes things happen from a uh, supply center perspective and make sure that we're all singing from the same sheet of music. So he was also here today. And, and several others uh, that have key roles. Uh, Libby Flaherty is here. I think many of you know she helps you with uh, all of your money issues. She is seated up here in the front row. Bill Tinston was here. There are a lot of familiar faces around the building today up in your work area. Uh, everybody could not get down for the all hands and uh, they send their regards and they left it to me, and so you're, I don't know if that's good or bad, but we're going to take it from there anyway. So um, if we could go to the next slide, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what I'm going to cover. I'm going to go back and review with you the same presentation that I gave at Admiral Lippert's most recent Senior Leaders Conference. And uh, this is important because I want for you to see not only uh, what I present to Admiral Lippert, but I want for you to see what an important part you play in the things that I am reporting back to the enterprise, the corporate board, Admiral Lippert, etc. So you'll see exactly what it was presented. Now what you won't get to see is the way that it was presented because it was a three-part show. I did part of it, Ted Case did part of it, and the other uh, senior executive in J6, Dave Falvey, uh, who you've all seen before at uh, BSM Roadshows, did part of it. So I will probably speed through a portion of it so that you don't uh, uh, have to sit and listen to me brief a bunch of charts. I want to get to your questions. So, but I am going to run through it. And uh, it's all going to be made available. It has been up on the J6 website. And I also understand from Bruce that this is being taped. Uh, so you're always free to ask questions and email us if there's anything that you didn't quite understand or you want more information on. Uh, then I'm going to just cover quickly some headquarters interest items. And uh, this is uh, patterned after the town hall that I give also at the headquarters for all of the folks that are there on the J6 staff. And so uh, I will also tailor that a bit because you don't have the same level of interest in what goes on at the headquarters that they do, you know, because you are where you live. Uh, so uh, I will probably scale some of that back. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about what's going on inside of J6, and then we'll close with some Q&A. Uh, and uh, at any time, if I am uh, either uh, you, don't, you can't hear me or I'm going too quickly, uh, please stop me and slow me down. But I would ask that we, we hold questions until the end. Uh, so with that, if we could go to the next slide. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to now cover some of these senior leaders' charts and uh, show you what I showed the Admiral. Next slide. Uh, what we did was uh, we talked about the progress that we've made in the past year. In J6 as an organization, we covered current initiatives, both from a programmatic sense and from a technology sense, and then we took a quick look ahead. Now, uh, what I want to make sure you all recognize is that uh, when I tell you that we briefed this to Admiral Lippert and his senior leaders conference, uh, that, that is quite a large group of people. That is all of the commanders and deputies from all of the field activities uh, from Europe and Pacific and all of the senior staff from the headquarters. And so that, that's a pretty big group of people that get this update. Um, I also uh, would point out that this is uh, maybe only the second or third time that J6 as an organizational entity has had an opportunity to brief to that group of people. Uh, there are some parameters uh, around this. Uh, as, as all of you know, uh, most general officers and senior people uh, have uh, calendars that are hideous. And so Admiral Lippert's one of those folks. And so he really does keep us to a tight time frame. So I only had, uh, I think, 45 minutes to do this. And uh, so you may not see your specific program or project in here, uh, but don't let that detract from the importance of it. Uh, it is impossible for me to cover every single thing that all of us do. Because when I talk about J6, I am talking about, uh, if you will, all of the program management staff that reports to Mr. Falvey, 
all of the programs that he oversees, all of the infrastructure initiatives that Mr. Wilson and Mr. Case have going on, all of the things that the CERT does, everything that happens in the DCOs, and that's all of the DCOs, Philadelphia, Columbus, uh, Utah, uh, the folks up in Mechanicsburg, the couple of uh, people that we've got uh, co-located with some of the customers. That covers all of BSM. It covers everything that happens at DLIS up in Battle Creek. It covers everything that happens at DAS-C in Dayton. And it covers everything at every DAPS location worldwide, in addition to what we do at the headquarters. And so when I say I give a J6 update and I get 45 minutes, uh, you know that I'm not, I cannot possibly tell everything that we do. So uh, what we try to do is pick out some uh, items of high interest and cover those at these forums. Next slide. I always like to repeat what I believe our primary role is whenever we have a large group of people together because there's always a few new general officers and new senior executives in that crowd. And so it's always a good time to sort of do a, a review of who we are and what we do with them. Uh, our primary role in J6 is to deliver IT capabilities in support of mission needs, clear and simple, straightforward, bottom line. Uh, that involves all of the things that are listed above that. It means uh, working with all of the uh, functionals uh, to make sure that we're delivering their requirements to them. It means setting a strategic direction for IT for the agency. It means leading the community of IT professionals, shaping the IT culture, which I'm going to talk a lot about today. Managing the IT portfolio, I do have a slide on that, and if you've been in any of these town halls with me before, you know that I'm going to state some astronomical numbers uh, in terms of dollars that we spend on information technology annually. Uh, we also uh, see as our charge to train and oversee program managers who have uh, their discipline in uh, information technology and uh, representing DLA uh, to the IT community beyond our gates, and that is largely the job of myself and uh, Mr. Falvey and Mr. Case and the headquarters staff that uh, attend a lot of the OSD meetings where policy is set and other uh, things go on. And we also have an enterprise -y business role uh, from the community perspective, meaning we do a lot of e-business services for the DOD uh, going beyond just what we do for our own agency. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, when we stood up uh, uh, the J6, you may all recall that we went through something called DLA 21, and it was a pretty significant reorganization in terms of the way that we realigned the entire agency uh, to meet the needs and the changing requirements of the warfighter. And we did it to align with Joint Vision 2010 and some other very strategic uh, thinking that was happening that, at that time in the department. And what we really uh, wanted to focus on was uh, getting into more of an operational role and getting away from a division between staff people and operational people and trying to bring everyone into uh, more of an operational environment. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, when we did that, uh, it was not easy. And so uh, to, in order to ease this transition, the executives got together and said, we need to come up with some tenets, if you will, some rules by which we will live, some beliefs that we all can sign up to relative to what each of these major codes will do. So for each of the big major codes, J1, J3, J6, J8, we came up with the tenets by which we all were willing and able to operate. And for IT, these are just the highlights. And so the very first one says that the current operation is our number one priority. There are parts of J6 where that's not news. If you go and you talk to the people that work the CERT desk, if you go and you talk to the guys at DASC, if you go and you speak to some of the uh, people at DAPS, that they are in an operational mode day to day. And so this didn't come as any surprise to them. But for others among us, uh, this was a little a bit different than what they were uh, accustomed to. And certainly, I will tell you from my personal experience, this was a complete change for the headquarters staff, who for many years uh, focused on writing policy and procedure and really were not 
involved in the day-to-day -day operation of this organization. And so uh, this has changed, and uh, Mr. Jarvis and I have had several uh, very good conversations over the past couple of days relative to what that means to DCO. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, everything we do in IT needs to be driven by the mission need. Uh, I have a little saying that a lot of people like to quote. I guess it's cute. Uh, but that is, we are not here to do science projects. Um, most, if not all of us, have a very, very strong foundation, whether it is a formal education or it came from a lot of on-the-job experience. But we have a great love for technology. We have a great love for the bits and the bytes. We are fascinated with things. My husband is always amazed at how long I can actually fool around with some little electronic device and, and be completely fascinated and not be paying the least bit of attention to something that might be on fire on the stove because I just got a new handheld device and I want to set it up. Or I'm doing a wireless LAN in my house and I, you know, uh, someone's ringing the doorbell and I'm oblivious to it. And so we all have a tendency to be that way. And what we need to guard against as a community is to uh, not let that get in the way of paying attention to what our customer needs and what the mission requires and delivering the capabilities that they set forth. And so uh, I want to uh, explain that. And I, I have not uh, found that so much to be the case in the DCO community. But in other parts of our organization, I have uncovered uh, a number of interesting uh, science projects, which we've uh, had to put an end to because they're really not delivering a lot of value back to the organization. Uh, I have a focus on the enterprise. You hear me say that word a lot. And uh, that is because I consider the delivery of information technology back to DLA an enterprise event. Uh, and we, as an IT community, are an enterprise asset. And I would tell you that we are a critical enterprise asset. And we have got to be guided by an architecture that says there is an, a way that the organization is going to operate. There are systems that support that operational architecture for which we are all critically, critically involved. And then there is an, an IT technology architecture, if you will, a technical architecture that we need to build and maintain to support the systems uh, architecture and the operational architecture. We do have the charge for the enterprise architecture in J6. As a matter of fact, we actually have an individual whose job title is enterprise architect, and that is Miss Kitty Eisler, who has worked for me for many years, has worked for me in a number of different organizations and locations. She is the DLA enterprise architect. That does not mean that she makes all of the decisions relative to what the operational architecture should look like. That's the job of J3. But it is Kitty's job to keep the discipline around making sure we've got an enterprise architecture. It is her job to uh, be able to construct it in a way that it's understandable to the uh, community, to make sure that all of the required systems and technical architectures are built to support that operational architecture. And it is her job to make sure that it is kept in such a fashion that it's available and understandable to the community at large. I believe that IT is a strategic tool, and it gives us a competitive business advantage. And in the world of DOD, the competitive business advantage has a different meaning. It's not a profit motivation. But for us, I believe it is responsiveness and reliability back to the warfighter. And so in order to get that competitive advantage out of any systems configuration, you have to understand the business. You have to understand the urgency uh, surrounding the supply chain. And you have to understand uh, all of the things that need to happen within that supply chain in order to get that product to the warfighter. And so as we configure the uh, business systems modernization suite of tools, this is uh, one of the things that we're focused on. And I can tell you that uh, uh, from our uh, very early experience, we are already uh, have not only met but exceeded our own expectations on how quickly uh, we can uh, fulfill orders using BSM uh, for product that is stored in the warehouse system. Far, far faster than we were able to do with our legacy system. Uh, I would tell you also that uh, for us to really be able to have an enterprise IT environment, it must be centrally planned and resourced. 
and I am personally responsible for doing that. And it is my hope and desire that as we go through the next few years and we retire our legacy systems uh, to get a better uh, consolidation and uh, handle on all of the things called IT so that uh, we have a really strong suite of information technology products that we have available for our workforce and that uh, they are delivered as a utility to the desktop. And I think you all know that we have signed up to COTS and that we have said we will uh, use COTS and uh, uh, leverage COTS to the maximum extent possible. You also see that it talks about outsourcing operations. For those of you that are not aware, we have outsourced uh, the um, operations of the uh, BPC, which is the BSM Production Center. That is the site where they actually run the software. That is not where we do any of the configuration. It's not where we do any of the software work. It is uh, what DISA does today for us in SAMS. And as it currently stands, Lockheed Martin has that role. And uh, we are uh, certainly watching that very closely to see if this is the right thing to do. But I would tell you that thus far the results have been extremely positive. Um, that environment has been very stable, has been available uh, in accordance with all of the uh, KPIs, the key performance indicators that we put in place. And uh, for all intents and purposes, the CIO is happy with the service that's being delivered there. So uh, that, that has been a very good engagement with them. Next slide. Next one, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about progress. We can go on to the next one. Thank you. Uh, some of the big things that happened in J6 over the last year were things that I covered at this particular uh, senior leaders conference. At that point in time, we had gotten to milestone C, and we had uh, just begun concept demonstration for BSM. Uh, we also, I believe, have really done a great job in managing the portfolio, the $4 billion investment over the POM period in information technology. I believe that Mr. Falvey has done an outstanding job in strengthening and enforcing and really leveraging this thing called the PEO process, which is his job, and that is uh, where all of the program managers are reporting to a single PEO. I'm going to talk about some of his programs in a bit. And I also point out that I think that as a, an organization, we have done an unbelievable job in sustaining the contemporary and legacy environment in preparation for uh, the future. And that's uh, certainly something near and dear to everyone's heart here in this room. And it's more than, and than SAMS. It's SAMS, it's DISMS, it's DSS, it's DAISY, it's BOSS. I could go on and on. So many of these systems that are not even on the list yet for any kind of replacement or upgrade uh, that we have had to keep running and integrated and make changes to the interfaces so that they could talk back and forth to BSM. I see that as a huge, huge achievement for us in the past year. Next slide. From a BSM perspective at that point in time, uh, I was able to say that we were on schedule and within budget, and I believe we still are. Uh, concept demonstration has been wonderful. Concept demonstration has been very hard. We have learned a lot in this. That was the purpose of it. You remember Admiral Archer saying it's a time of discovery. We discovered more than we set out to discover, I think. Uh, however, uh, uh, I am quite pleased with how this has gone thus far. Next slide. Uh, I think you all know where we've been. I've been out to visit uh, regularly uh, to talk about BSM. <coughs> We've been through all of these steps, and we did go live. Uh, next slide. Uh, this uh, indicates that we expect to reach a steady state on the 1st of December in BSM. I will tell you that we have already declared a steady state for two of the four major processes. We've declared a steady state for order fulfillment and for finance. Uh, we believe we're very close to a steady state in planning. I mean in terms of probably less than 10 days. And procurement has become the, the uh, most difficult uh, part of this equation. And uh, we do not think that we will be able to really have a forecast on a steady state there until the 15th of December, <coughs> roughly, maybe longer than that. Uh, to that end, we have had some pretty serious conversations 
Uh, just yesterday, Mr. Lotz and I uh, co-chaired a very important meeting to talk about where we are with PD2 and whether or not we need to give serious consideration to reversing the decision and using DPACs. Uh, part of that is driven, there's, there's a couple of things that are driving that. The first thing that's driving it, the most important thing that's driving it has been the ongoing inability uh, of us to get that system to operate the way that we believe it needs to operate. We are unable to reach the production numbers that we put in place as our goals for PD2. Uh, now, we have not given up yet, and uh, many of you have seen Admiral Lippert's message to the workforce regarding this. His expectation is that we redouble, retriple, requadruple re our effort to make PD2 work. We've spent a lot of money on it. Uh, when you sit down at the desktop uh, with a user, uh, it does work. Yeah, it is uh, good technology. However, we're having a lot of problems with it. And so his first expectation of us is to, to do everything we possibly can to make it work. Um, however, if we are unable to make the production numbers, uh, we have to give serious consideration to DPACs. The second thing I would tell you is that the volumes coming out of SAP and Manugistics into PD2 are uh, far greater than we anticipated. Part of that is the way that we configured the system, and part of it is that the system has not really run end-to-end -end in a steady state long enough for us to get a true feel for what that throughput will be. And so we need to continue to monitor that before we make any decisions. And the last reason is that all of you know that there is serious talk in this country about the possibility of a significant military action. And so Admiral Lippert wants to make sure that he has done all of his due diligence and that if we need to really ramp up in terms of production in our systems, that we have got a software package that can take us there. And so for those three reasons, we're giving a serious look at DPACs. Um, we have uh, uh, asked uh, Bruce and Susan and their team to put a program manager in place and to partner with the folks here in Columbus to begin a 35% design of what it would take for us to put DPACs into the existing BSM environment. Uh, this is a uh, risk mitigation strategy at this point. We haven't decided to do this. However, the reason that I'm here is to tell you exactly what is going on, and, and that is why I want to explain all of this in terms of uh, what you may have already heard uh, around the water cooler in the last 24 hours. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, I think I said much of this uh, from, a, from my perspective as the CIO, this transition to BSM was very smooth. Now, I am talking strictly as a technologist here. I will tell you that the systems have been very stable. The telecom support, which I'm going to touch on later, that uh, the folks here in Columbus uh, at uh, DCO have been a huge help with, has been outstanding. Uh, response times are, are good. Uh, I have put in many systems in my uh, career. Uh, the response times are never exactly where they need to be when you first get started, but we all know that there's a lot of tuning involved in getting response times to where they need to be. Plus, there's a lot of user uh, learning curve that you've got to get through. And so we're making it through all of that. Uh, we have done, a, uh, in the beginning, a daily, then a three-time-a-week flash call that I have hosted. Many of you have probably listened in on that where we've had every single site on the line to talk about every single thing that went on, all of the changes that have to be done, all of the fixes, and all the problems that were, people were experiencing. I think that was an extremely useful way of getting the, uh, the system to where it needed to be. We got through the big issues, the big uh, startup issues that you would expect, sign on. People had trouble with signing on. If any of you remember me saying at every town hall, that it was going to be tricky signing on and that we were going to have to sign on a couple of times. It, all it was true. It was very tricky. Uh, however, um, when it actually occurred, uh, I think it helped people uh, sense the urgency of the situation and we were able to come up with some technology fixes that uh, alleviated some of that sign on issue. Uh, we've also uh, put in an automated system to track responsiveness. It's a Mercury tool called Topaz. Many of you are probably familiar with it. 
Uh, and uh, right now we're emphasizing getting the overall system stabilized and what I really am concentrating on right now is PD2. And uh, we're also working on the um, notification system. Uh, many of you know that we are putting up notifications when the system's down, when it's up, and uh, they're not, that's not quite where it needs to be because we're notifying people of things that really have no impact on the user at the desktop. So we need to clean some of that up. Next slide. Uh, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of these achievements in uh, Mr. Falvey's area. Next slide. Uh, here it is, the famous chart that you always see me show, uh, just to remind you that if you thought uh, DLA wasn't still serious about IT, uh, well, when you sp spend $4 billion over the Palm period, you're spending it on something. And so uh, those are the numbers. Um, I'm also happy to say that uh, Mr. Case was able to deliver some savings in the past year uh, through some pretty smart uh, technology uh, uh, strategies that he's been able to put out for the out years. And so uh, there is the number. Uh, we're slightly now under that $4 billion mark. That's a good thing. Makes Admiral Lippert very happy when we spend less money. Uh, but uh, just to drive home uh, just how big the information technology uh, world is at DLA, the numbers are still very significant. And the colors do have meaning. Uh, you can see that the uh, business systems modernization portfolio is uh, the lower one. Uh, the center one is e-business. It is the smallest of the three. And infrastructure continues to be the biggest investment that we make. And I believe that it is somewhere in the neighborhood of 54 to 56 percent of our overall spending annually is on infrastructure. And that is everything. I account for everything from what we spend with uh, DISA, to what we spend with Lockheed Martin, to what we spend on the mid-tiers that run at all of the ICPs, to what we're spending on uh, laptops, desktops, printers, peripherals, et cetera. Next slide. Now, I will tell you that there is a process in place. I won't linger here. This is very exciting for people that work for the comptroller or people that work POM issues, but we have a pretty structured process in place uh, that helps us get through uh, getting things into the IT Palm and f getting me to the point where I get up at that sometime around the April May time frame and tell Admiral Lippert what I need to spend over the next four or five years and this is the process that is in place last year because of this process you can see that we started out with them wanting me to go forward and make a report of some number of around the I guess that's I can't see even with my glasses, but it looks like th uh, $3 million. I don't know if that's a comma or a period. And when we fought, we came in it with zero growth. And so we started out going back to the boss saying, sir, we're going to spend, we think we need to spend uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars more than we have in the past. And after we finished going through this process, we were able to go back to him and say, sir, we don't think we need any extra money. We've made trade-offs within the portfolios to cover all of our new starts. Next slide. Uh, emerging systems, the province of Mr. Falvey. Uh, he oversees all of this. This is my previous position. This is probably one of the best jobs in the agency. I, I really enjoyed doing this job. Um, he has uh, oversight of all of our major systems and uh, his job is to not only make sure that the program managers are delivering their programs in accordance with cost schedule and performance he also has the job of synchronizing all of those programs across the agency and so uh, he has all of the uh, big programs reporting to him he reports to me on a regular basis uh, on the status of those and via the balanced scorecard he reports back to the agency as a whole on the status of all of these. Uh, let's go to the next slide. He also has a program underway for training new program and project managers. And this has been wildly successful. When he and I showed up on the scene, uh, I guess around 1997 or 1998, I think he and I were the only two people qualified to do this kind of job at the, at the thresholds that we were looking at. And uh, he and I have successfully gotten a pretty good cadre of people trained and ready, and we continue to do that. I know some of you uh, have attended uh, some of these conferences, 
And the game plan here is to identify the people that need to be trained at the various levels and uh, to start out by trying to get as many people as we can through Acquisition 101, which is available online. And for people that are interested, I have absolutely, there is no reason, there is nothing holding any specific individual back from taking that. We do prioritize people that are in jobs that need it, need to go get it first. Uh, but uh, anyone who's interested is uh, able to take that training. Uh, from there, you go to Acquisition 201. That's a little bit of a more difficult thing to get scheduled and for us to get people into. And once we get past that, there's a level three requirement that used to be a 14-week course. Uh, it is a long, drawn-out affair. It is for people that are really managing uh, uh, major, major programs the size of like a BSM, 750 million, or a FAS, or something of that nature. Those program managers have to take that course. Next slide. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about things that we've done to keep uh, the engines running while everybody else is off uh, cooking up new things. Next slide. Uh, yes, you were in there. Uh, I did talk about DCO. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to make sure we got straight uh, was uh, some clarification or uh, some misconceptions that have been floating around for a long time. And I do know that there were previous people in my position who had a different vision. And their vision was that uh, we weren't going to need any organic people, uh, meaning any government employees working in these kinds of jobs anymore. And I do not agree with that, and that is not the plan. And so in order for me to make sure everybody gets it, uh, I want to make sure that they not only hear me say that, but they understand why I'm saying it. And the reason that I am saying it is we add great value. Now, it doesn't mean we do everything, because we, for us to do everything, we'd have to probably quadruple our size. But for the things that uh, uh, we do best, uh, we, we add tremendous value. So I talked a little bit about some of our recent achievements. And at this point in time that I gave this briefing, there, there was this, uh, uh, I don't know, they, they have this thing the kids do now, they ran or they rave or they do something, I don't know, but it's, it's pretty intense. It's like a significant emotional event. The agency was having this significant emotional event over some work that the DCO folks did out in uh, Ogden, Utah, to get DSS to do some pretty slick stuff uh, to enable the DDC to do something called first destination transportation. And when Admiral Lippert saw it, he was just wild over it. And so I reminded everyone of that. The second thing that happened was there was an SCR called end-to-end -end distribution. And nobody really quite got that at first or knew what that was about. And that came out here to Columbus to be worked on. And again, uh, not only did we do that, uh, that got done ahead of schedule, significantly ahead of schedule. And Mr. Frank Lotz, who is probably our best customer and also our toughest customer, went all through the headquarters building when I told him that it was completed and tested and he heard back from the users that it was correct and they loved it. And he told almost every senior person what an outstanding job you did and how thrilled he was and how delighted he was and how important you were to him. And so that was a big, big win for us. The folks in Philadelphia also had their moment in the sun. They did something called favors modernization. I got a little offended when they told me about this because I wrote favors and I guess when people start telling you that they have to modernize something that you did, you know you're getting old. But at any rate, it was the right thing to do. And um, again, uh, the team in Philadelphia did a great job with that. They got it done ahead of schedule, and uh, the folks in Philadelphia were very, very pleased with it. Now, the other big achievement I believe that we have uh, accomplished here of late is that not only did I get agreement, if you remember I told you all this before, got agreement from the MEB, which is the oversight body for BSM, that DCO would have a role in sustaining BSM. Remember that. Not only did I get them to agree to it, we're doing it. So, you know, there's one thing to get everybody to agree, and then there's a whole, it's a whole other thing for you to actually do it. 
you know how that goes. You know, there's like laws on the books, but nobody enforces them, that kind of thing. So uh, many of you are involved and have been involved in getting trained and actually doing the day-to-day -day work uh, that is now transitioning to sustainment, being called sustainment. And uh, many of the leaders here uh, uh, that are here with us this, this afternoon, Claire and Dewey and uh, many, many more people that are here in the audience know this has been very hard. Not only did everybody have to learn a whole new skill set, you had to do it quickly and you had to kind of learn as you went. And so I am really proud of what we've done with this. And I'm a little worried about uh, uh, keeping up the momentum, but I think that uh, over the past couple of days, we've done some things and given Bruce some direction on some things that should help. Uh, the last thing that I'll tell you that we're doing a great job on is sustaining SAMS and really uh, keeping it running to the degree it needs to run and being very, very uh, consistent in our approach to how we need to brown that system out. And so, to me, these are huge achievements, uh, and there are many, many, many more. As a matter of fact, I have a two-page list of things uh, that, that I was able to come up with that happened right here at this DCO location in the past year that you should all be very, very proud of. But uh, I selected these because this group of people all knew what these were. And so uh, when you're able to put them up with a map and say, you know, every one of those locations delivered one of these huge success stories back to the customer, that's a very powerful thing to be able to tell them. Now, this transition of the staff has been tough, as I said, but we are going to press on. And one of the things that I have uh, impressed, I hope, upon the senior leaders here in this DCO, and that I've been out across the the entire organization saying is, one of the things we must absolutely cultivate quickly, if we haven't already, and I know many of you have, is a sense of absolute urgency. One of the biggest criticisms that I get as I speak to other people who want to be candid with me, that's always dangerous. People decide they want to be candid, that's usually because they want to tell you something you don't want to hear, you know, but is that we don't have a sense of urgency in all cases. And so as we transition from uh, uh, what we were before to what we're going to be in the future, uh, one of the most important things we need to <coughs> embrace is the sense of urgency. So we're going we're gonna to work on it. I can tell you that if you visit CP5, there's always a sense of urgency. It's kind of infectious. Uh, but uh, I think that of all the cultural things that we need to do, uh, even if you think to yourself, I always had it, well, maybe we never said it or we never showed it as much as we needed to. Next slide. Uh, this you know about. I'm not going to linger here. This is still the schedule. Now, last year we didn't even do as much in SAM's maintenance as we signed up to do, and I expect the same thing is going to happen this year. So we'll see how this goes. But uh, there's also talk here recently of uh, browning out DISMs. That's another little sling to my heart because I was the DISMS, uh, I, I was a DISMS person in the beginning and worked on the procurement uh, system and then I was the DISMS program manager and uh, by way of some interesting little background, that is where I met my husband and he stayed on in DISMS for many years after I left and uh, we are now talking about uh, taking DISMs down in the next 12 months. And so as if that didn't sort of, you know, give me that little twinge enough, they also decided that the first person they're putting in to look at this and uh, lead the charge is my husband. <laughs> so uh, that's two of us that are getting a little twinge. But uh, uh, I would, uh, the, the plan as it stands right now is to take a real hard look at retiring DISMs well in advance of retiring SAMs. Next slide. Next slide. I'm not going to even talk about this. For those of you that know Dave Falvey, you know this is a Falvey chart. Uh, this is one of his architecture uh, charts. He uses this to explain to people what he means by architecture. Um, he has done more thinking on this than probably anyone uh, else in the whole organization. And it's a good thing because Dave is a very a cogent person who puts things 
down and tries to make sense of them all, and we need for someone to do that. Um, but that is pretty much the lineup of all of the big initiatives and programs that are underway in the agency right now from an IT perspective. Next slide. He talked about BSM. I'm not going to linger on this. This just gives you a pretty good idea, though, of what kind of updates he gives back to me and to the uh, corporation. He uses these, what he calls, quadrant charts. And he always shows the stoplights for cost schedule performance. He always shows what his upcoming critical tasks are from his plan of action and milestones. He always shows what the current status is, and he always talks about issues. Next slide. He does the same thing for the fuels automated system. Many of you know that's the energy system. That's the equivalent of BSM, roughly equivalent, uh, that we will also be taking down DFAMs that our uh, DCO uh, contingent that uh, works on that is in the throes of doing very much what we're doing here. Some people work on FAST. Some people are sustaining DFAMs. We're headed out to the future, and uh, they've got that pretty well under control. Next slide. CRM, Customer Relationship Management. Brand new program. Uh, has a yellow on schedule because we had a small slip in the beginning. This is not unusual. Uh, more to come on this. I would tell you that uh, in the next year, we should see contracts awarded and people on board helping us figure out what we want our business process to be in support of doing CRM. Uh, from an IT perspective, it calls into question whether we'll continue with Support Magic as the tool at the help desks and some other um, integration questions relative to BSM. But this is a very new uh, program. Next slide. Knowledge management, also very new. Rex McHale is the uh, program manager for this at headquarters. Uh, this is uh, right now focused on uh, employee services. And we're going to have a pilot up in the headquarters in December. And when this is finally uh, delivered, what you will be able to use this for is things such as uh, one-stop shopping to look at the balance scorecard, to look at uh, one bulk, to look at a community of practice. Uh, I would think that, you know, the, the uh, IT community would probably form a community of practice where we would have our own area where we would be able to have subject matter experts that publish on certain subjects and put it up there for everybody to read it. Uh, you would, we will also put access to things there like all of your uh, employee services so that you would be able to use this tool to go out and look at your personnel folder to change your health benefits plan, things of that nature. Next slide. DPMS is Distribution Planning and Management System. It is um, uh, leveraging some of the uh, capabilities that we saw as we blueprinted BSM in the uh, Advanced Planning and Scheduling tool. Again, this is uh, still pretty uh, much in its infancy, although uh, ahead of the others that I mentioned. And uh, the uh, group of people that this will uh, deliver capability to is largely the DDC. Next slide. IDE, Integrated Data Environment. Many of you are aware of this. Mr. Paul Peters has been out to talk to folks about it. Uh, I would tell you that this is the modernization uh, and digitization of the current environment that we call MILS and uh, some of the other things that uh, one would uh, think about when you, th when you think about the DOD community at large and what the MILS environment really seeks to do. It seeks to make us interoperable. It seeks to give all of the DOD players a single point of uh, reachback capability to authoritative records and sources of information. And so IDE is the uh, program that modernizes uh, all of the uh, processes and technologies that uh, the DASI uses, uh, many of the things that DLIS does, and uh, some of the interfaces uh, and BSM will reside here, and all of the reachback capability that tools like JTAV require. This is a big program. It is uh, very technically oriented, uh, and uh, it is the, really uh, one of the most important underlying programs to making all of the rest of the modernization efforts successful. Next slide. Next slide. Now we'll talk about a little of technology. I talked about architecture, different drawings, same idea. Next slide. This is a big deal. This is something that uh, you all here in Columbus have helped with immensely. 
This is called Enterprise Telecom Network. This, this is part of what I'm talking about when I say we need to become more operational. It's also a, a huge, huge partnership between us and DISA on network operations. Uh, we have a, a deal uh, that we have brokered with them uh, that allows for us to share in a network operations center so that we have visibility, the same visibility that they have over our network. It got us in uh, on the ground floor of all of the upgrades that DISA was making to their telecom. It allowed us to prioritize the points that we needed to really have big pipe, if you will. And so we have already upgraded uh, the bandwidth uh, between some of our BSM sites. And we are on a pretty aggressive schedule to continue and finish that. And those are the lines that you see depicted in red. DLA will be responsible for all of the spokes in that hub and spoke system. All of it will be visible, though, to both DISA and to DLA in this joint venture called NEMO. It will be located here in Columbus. It has already been stood up. Uh, and it has been absolutely essential uh, to getting BSM off the ground. This is a huge, huge win for us, both in terms of this was, uh, when I came into the job, uh, one of the first things I told the team was, if we cannot get the bandwidth and we don't have the, the uh, backbone, we can't do any of this modernization. We're just not going to be able to do it. All of this online stuff, all of the ad hoc, all of the reach back, we won't be able to do it. And so, uh, uh, we, we were able to get this uh, program up and off the ground, and it is a really a roaring success. Next slide. Uh, you all know about this, I think. Uh, this is kind of a three-part deal. The first one is asset management. Uh, we have awarded a contract to begin the process of putting an automated tool in place so that every single electronic device that is hooked to the LAN or the WAN can be discovered and uh, monitored and tracked. Corporately, uh, we are underway with this. Uh, Cindy Hall is the headquarters program manager for this. Long time coming. We've got the DOD CIO watching this very carefully to see if it's a success or not, because you know if it is, uh, they will want to leverage this uh, department wide. Uh, we also are in the midst of upgrading uh, our uh, Microsoft platforms. Uh, we want to get to the point where we have got Active Directory out to everybody. Uh, unfortunately, one of our own internal organizations has had some problems in getting there, and we've had to extend the schedule on this a bit, and that's DAPS. All of you know they've gone through an A76, and so you can imagine uh, that uh, getting to uh, this uh, white, uh, Windows uh, 2000 has not been uh, easy for them because they've had to re-wicker their whole schedule based on their most efficient organization. Uh, the other thing that we are uh, headed for is global email. Uh, the plan is to migrate from all of these uh, servers all over the place and consolidate these servers in one location and to go to one email system and to change the naming convention so that everyone in the agency has the same naming convention and you don't have to know someone's geographic location to send them email. So in this scenario, I will just be may.devincentis at dla.mil. And the rest of you will all have the same naming convention. Next slide. Uh, I talked a little bit about the, the uh, business processing center in uh, Denver, which is the site that is now processing all of the BSM work. There's also something coming down the pike, which is uh, the next step, which is called Enterprise Data Center. And this is a, an initiative to consolidate all of the mid-tier servers across the agency, all of the things that are not in the demilitarized zone that this is going to run for us, which is all of our business uh, critical applications that we need to be able to get the, out there when port 80 gets closed down. Um, and uh, we will have a complete backup and recovery uh, strategy to accompany this. Uh, EDC is also. Uh, uh, on, in the planning stages, uh, the expectation right now is that we will get an RFQ out in the next 60 days and uh, begin the planning process for this. Uh, the, the savings associated with this are very significant. 
Uh, and when we talk about uh, servers and pieces of equipment, I don't have the numbers with me, but when I saw it, I, I, I knew that the numbers were big, but when I actually got the counts, the numbers were, were astronomical. Uh, so we have got, you know, every single site in the agency with their own uh, boxes and their own platforms, and uh, then, of course, all of the, the people who contract stuff out, and the numbers are quite large. So uh, a consolidation effort here and a streamlining effort here will, will give the uh, agency a lot of savings. Next slide. I mentioned DMZ. This is a big uh, uh, boon, both to information assurance and, more importantly, to the continuity of business operations. This is a, an attempt on our part to uh, get ourselves in a situation where we never get taken out of business again by a port 80 closer, closure. You may remember the red worm when that virus was running amok. DISA took down uh, port 80, which is our access from the nipper net out to the internet. It virtually shut us down from a business perspective. Uh, we had many conversations with them, uh, explained to them that we have an absolute requirement to have our websites up. Uh, for business critical applications like procurement gateway and dibs and all of the things that uh, the, the disposal people do and reverse auctioning and the fast people. So uh, we came up with a prioritized list of 32 websites. And uh, this, again, is ahead of schedule. And uh, we now are moving the sites in there and taking down uh, their uh, direct connections. And uh, everything else will go behind the DLA firewall. This is also a big deal from an information assurance perspective. We spend a fortune on intrusion detection and all of the IAVAs and all of the patches that every single person has to put in because we've got all these doors open to the internet. And so this will uh, resolve a lot of that. Next slide. Uh, enterprise contracts, I won't go into the details. Headquarters has been uh, hard at work. Uh, Sandra King, many of you know her, she's been with us for uh, a number of years has done an unbelievable job in getting great prices uh, for us uh, on all of these enterprise and corporate contracts with these various providers of software products and intrusion detection, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, you all know about the IOP. This is the IT chiefs from the field activities. Uh, this uh, got its start with me uh, a number of years ago. Uh, we are tightening this up uh, as, w as the days go by. BSM has taught us a lot of lessons. I think it's a good thing that it's taught us a lot of lessons. And so uh, we are uh, continuing to operate in this collaborative fashion. But as we move forward with BSM uh, and um, all of the, the requirements uh, fade for all of these individual uh, IT staffs, uh, we need to take a hard look at what the role of the field IT folks will be as we move forward with BSM. Next slide. Next slide. So uh, for the next uh, 12 months, uh, this is what I'm focused on, delivering on the promise. I'm always making promises that I always have to deliver on. But I think that's my job. So you know, I, I showed uh, what some of the past promises were that I made and what we delivered. Among them, uh, getting, uh, getting our IT staff uh, back to the uh, uh, level of uh, importance and uh, respect that they needed to be, and then bring some actual capabilities. Leveraging the portfolio, we, we delivered some savings. Achieving some efficiencies, finishing some unfinished business in this next year. Uh, among that, those things, uh, looking at help desks, streamlining the way we're doing that, uh, looking at how we're doing Mercator translation, streamlining that. Uh, you know, sort of uh, doing all of the, the little things that we couldn't do as we stood up BSM, uh, taking down DISMs, negotiating that departure from the mega center with DISA, finalizing the rules of engagement for pulling out on SAMs, and then going global, which means global email, enterprise data center, all of those other things that we said we needed to do. I believe that is the last slide. Is that? A correct assessment? It was. Great. OK. So those are the formal slides from the Senior Leaders Conference. Now, uh, what I want to do is a couple of real quick uh, other items that I want to update you on. I think you all know Admiral Archer retired. It was quite an event. Uh, a lot of us called it the prom. We all got to go out and buy sparkly dresses and rent tuxedos and uh, dance the night away with Admiral Archer. 
He accepted a position at Dell, and he is now the vice president of supply chain there. I've talked to him since he's left, and he's very, very happy. And he always asks how we're doing with BSM, so he's still real interested in how we're making out. Uh, Major General Saunders is the new vice, not so new at this point, but she is the vice. She's at the headquarters, and you all remember her from when she was here in Columbus. She is an energetic person. She adds an awful lot of value to what we do every day. And she is our main ally when it comes to dealing with our service partners. And so uh, she is very focused on making sure that the Air Force, the, the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps all understand where we're headed strategically and are on board with us moving forward. She has not taken on the same role in BSM that Admiral Archer had. Uh, we have brought on a new senior executive. His name is Alan Banghart. He is a retired Navy captain, and he is the BSM champion. And uh, when we come out to do a road show, you'll get to meet him. But he is the, uh, my new partner uh, in uh, making sure that BSM uh, continues to be the premier program in DOD and making it uh, happen on time and making sure all the stakeholders are brought in on that. So you'll all get to meet him on the next trip out. Uh, we did have a departure from J6. Uh, many of you uh, know Nancy Johnson. She was the head of e-business. Uh, Ms. Johnson was uh, having some uh, uh, health problems in addition to some uh, significant family issues and decided to, uh, to step down from her position and to take a year uh, to go off with industry. And so as we speak, Nancy is off uh, uh, doing her thing. and. Uh, the last I, I knew, she was extremely pleased with her decision, and uh, she's still part of the J6 family. So if you see Nancy in your travels, she may be with uh, some contractors. She hasn't quit, uh, but she's out there for a year with industry, and uh, uh, we expect uh, to see her back in DLA uh, probably sometime next fall. Uh, in the meantime, I am uh, in the process of uh, uh, relooking the way J6 is organized. Uh, I call it a nip and tuck because I don't like to do big reorganizations. They get everybody all upset, and it's not, that's not what we do it for. But we do need to look at that e-business organization uh, because we have uh, uh, made a decision and we've uh, finalized all of the negotiation with DISA to stand down that joint, what's called JECPO office. And so as we did that, it called into question the need to have an e-business leader and an e-business lead center. And I am personally of the belief that e-business is just part of what we do in IT, and we don't need a separate entity to do it. Uh, and uh, that, that was OK in the 90s when it was a new technology, but uh, I don't think we need to do that anymore. And so we're relooking that. But my, my plan is uh, to fill that position with a new SES. And so, uh, we are uh, currently talking among the, the leadership in J6 about how we want to proceed. Now, the other uh, thing that's important to you is that a big part of that will also be how we want to move forward in the way the DCO is structured. And yesterday, uh, Bruce presented Captain Wade and I with a uh, draft proposal of an organizational structure for the location here in Columbus. And I told him that uh, I am now convinced that either they've got some kind of eavesdropping equipment at the headquarters or he's reading my mind because I saw on that proposal a lot of things that I know we need to do across the entire J6. So for starters, they are, we need to do a better job of getting closer to the customer and of helping the customer figure out what their real requirement is. Well, it's something we've done really well in the past uh, through all of the changes and all of the things that have gone on. I think we've uh, lost our emphasis there. And so we need to look at how we want to revive that and do a better job. Customer touch overall is something that we really need to do. We need to do it better. And so I saw something that addressed that, which I, I think is, uh, again, uh, reading my mind, because it, it, in the headquarters, we also need to have a group that puts that process in place for you so that you've got the template to follow. Uh, I also uh, am concerned about uh, making sure that we are more focused on the day-to-day -day operation. And lo and behold, uh, there's Bruce with a, an organization 
that is focused on operations. And so, uh, again, uh, I think he's, uh, he's hitting uh, real close to what, what it is we're thinking at headquarters on how we need to look. Uh, so what, what I uh, have told uh, Bruce is, uh, I feel that just looking at it and talking through it with him, we're about 85% of the way there. I think that what Bruce presented is probably 85% of what you're going to see in its final form. And so I told him that he can release that for everybody to take a look at, uh, and call it a draft, but um, I, I think that uh, it's, it's all the right stuff, all the things that we all know we really need to do so that uh, you all here can see it and start to internalize it a little bit and think about it. Uh, I would say that there's some new things there that uh, we probably didn't do before, and we've shed ourselves of some things that we used to do that we don't need to do anymore. Uh, but the, the bottom line of it is, uh, it is an alignment to the new business. It is an alignment that gets us more uh, in line with DLA's strategy. And I think it's, uh, he's got just about all of the things in there that we really want to be able to do. Uh, I want to make sure, from my perspective, that it's aligned to what we do in J6. And so I asked him to put it out in draft and to give us uh, another uh, couple of uh, 30 to 45 days to walk through the rest of it because I am looking at the bigger J6 when I look at this. And so uh, even though he's got something that's really probably uh, close for here, I want to make sure that it's what we need to do across the board, that the other DCOs get to take a look, and that it fits in with the headquarters structure the way that we are moving forward. Uh, so uh, that's the good news on that. Uh, I don't, th uh, looking at that proposal, uh, I saw only uh, good things. I saw only uh, a bright future for the organization. And uh, as far as I am concerned, uh, we do have a bright future, a lot brighter than I would have thought uh, a few years ago. Uh, to that end, as I said earlier with another group, uh, I am the first person that will take your achievements and go, around the organization and show everyone what a great job we're doing. Uh, and that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, but uh, you're only as good as your last act. And I tell you that uh, when we cross that line from being a software development organization to uh, being more of an operational entity to being a lot more uh, responsive, to, because we've got these COTS tools in place and so we don't have these long development and delivery cycles that we used to have, to being called upon uh, to come up with some very, very quick assessments of uh, helping uh, with the procurement solution, for example. We've got to uh, get across this sense of urgency to the customer. We have to understand the customer and we have to con begin to operate uh, in a much more uh, responsive, proactive mode than we're used to. And this, this is going to be a, a little bit of a uh, uh, challenge because uh, I come from the same background and that was not our focus for a long, long time. But as we move forward, it needs to be. And this is not the only DCO group that's faced with the same thing. I'm headed up uh, soon to Philadelphia to my old stomping grounds. We've given them a lot of web work Talk about quick turnaround. You know, the customer is quick to say, I can contract this out and get it done in 24 hours. Now, will it be secure? Will it meet all of the requirements? You know, we could all go down the list of things. But when we give them back an estimate that's weeks, months to develop something, we turn them off. So um, I've uh, talked with Bruce, and uh, I think that, that he's, he understands where we need to head from here. But I also expect it to be. Uh, a little bit of a uh, change management issue for us, but I think we, we can do it. So I don't think I've overlooked anything. Uh, I do have uh, someone who works with me whose name is Steve Shertok, who a lot of you may remember when he was Captain Shertok. And he and I both worked together for uh, Admiral Straw. And he has uh, returned to work with me after being gone for many, many, many years. And he went with Admiral Straw to Ryder, and he went with him to Compaq, and he was getting ready to go with him to Estee Lauder, and through some miracle, I snagged him. And so 
he gets me ready for these town halls with all these notes so that I don't forget to tell you anything that, that's important. And so I'm just glancing through here. Uh, back when I did this, the first go round, there was some talk or some fear in the agency that um, there was a study being done to combine us with Transcom. That has been resolved. And uh, that was just reported out la last week, and that has uh, been taken off the table. There will be no combining or consolidating or mergers or acquisitions between DLA and Transcom. We have agreed to work with them and collaborate with them and partner with them and do all of those things that we are really very, very good at, but we will not be combining with them. And so if you were concerned about that, you can probably uh, tell your friends when you get back that, that that's been taken care of. And so I do believe that I have covered everything that you need to hear. So what I'd like to do, unless Captain Waite or Mr. Kimberly have something that I think I overlooked, is to open this to some Q&A, if I could. So if you have any questions for me, ask them now. This must have been very thorough. You can tell sure talk what a good job he did. Yeah? And you don't have a single question. Nobody's worried about a riff. Nobody's worried. None of you are worried that somehow. That, thank you very much. I appreciate that. That means a lot to me to hear you say that. Uh, I, you know, I cannot uh, make promises in terms of what the future is going to be, uh, because none of us can. You know, the world changes too quickly. But uh, I made a commitment when I came in uh, that if we did good work, if we all collectively did good work and we all added value, that I would be your strongest spokesperson, and that I would make it my my personal charge. Uh, to keep us relevant and to keep us in the mix. And so far, we are doing that. Um, I do not know uh, what some politician uh, will do somewhere in the future uh, in terms of giving us direction, giving Admiral Lippert direction on doing something that we might not have done absent that advice. However, if nothing else, uh, we are surely retooling ourselves and the fact that you are all uh, going to learn and become so conversant in these new tools, all of the SAP, Manugistics, all of these eGate tools, all of the new technologies that come to us with BSM, all of the exciting things that we're doing with IDE, this new network operations center, we are going to be a very tough team to beat. And I have always said, I will stand up next to any single person in industry, and I can always do a much better job. Now, to an individual, I know it's true of many of you, as an organization, it's a challenge to keep our edge. And so we need to focus on keeping our edge and staying ahead. And I tell you that as long as we do that, we are a very tough team to beat. And so, Unless you have some questions, a question. Yeah. Um, here at the uh, DIS Omega Center, um, there have been some people talking about how they're going to be closing the center down. It's going to be migrating to another data center. And I was just wondering how is that going to affect the um, I'm glad you asked me that because I heard that too. and I. I made them all laugh this morning because I said that I heard that in the halls while I was here. But that was actually true. I did. I overheard it in the elevator. Um, so I think it is still uh, a strong rumor. It has not been um, substantiated yet to me personally. Um, I do know that this has been taking a hard look at how they are organized and how many uh, centers they operate and whether or not it is the most cost-effective model for them. Uh, I do have a meeting uh, this coming Monday. I meet with Mr. John Garing uh, probably every other month. We, 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 we try to meet every month, but it, it just never happens. And I think that he will probably tell me more when I see him. My guess is there's some truth to it. All rumors have some truth to them. 
Uh, I, I can't speak uh, on behalf of DISA. I will tell you this. Uh, whatever they do, we will do whatever we have to do to support them. Uh, if they uh, decide uh, to take uh, the deck uh, and move that work around, I am sure they'll do it uh, with us, and they, will make, and they will ensure that it's a smooth transition. Uh, if it is a bumpy ride, uh, we've been on bumpy rides before, we can handle it. Uh, but as it stands right now, I don't know any more than what I have heard here in the halls about this. And so uh, what I will do is, if I get some, some news on this uh, from John on Monday, I will make sure that Captain Waite uh, gets that out to everyone so that everybody knows specifically uh, what the story is and what the impact, if any, is on us. I had also heard that, that if they did this, there would be no impact on the network operations that is uh, here that we have co-located with those folks. And so uh, we, I guess we'll have to wait and find out what, what the truth of it all is, but that is really the best I can do right now. Okay, does anyone else have any other questions? No? Great, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And also to point out the fact that when she says she's a, a strong proponent of ours, I've seen that happen many times over. She's telling the truth. And so uh, that, that's well worth the applause alone. On December 12th, I, I think you, when I announced this meeting, I mentioned that uh, uh, in addition to having the wrong date, I mentioned that we were going to get together on December 12th to talk about the reorg. At that time that I announced that, I, I hadn't really spoken to May. Um, and I uh, had got that feedback that I needed to say, you know, whether we were on the right track or not. Her comments pointed out that, yes, we, we, uh, we guessed right, uh, we did our homework, and that we're on the right track, but there are probably going to be some tweaks. Rather than share that information with you in a, in a written form where a lot of the context is not there, I would prefer to wait until December 12th, and, uh, and that way you get it in the full context that it was meant. Uh, to be given in. I don't believe it would make sense otherwise. So thank you very much for your time and, and May thank you for coming to Columbus.